Well, welcome to our time together in the house of the Lord uh, this evening here at the Salford Community Church. Uh, we ask that the Lord will bless us and a special welcome uh, to those who will be watching and listening online as well uh, this evening. Uh, let's just come and commit ourselves to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Merciful Father and gracious Lord, we do ask your blessing upon us now. And we thank you once more that we can find ourselves in your house on the Lord's day. Gathering, Lord, perhaps in the building, perhaps online, but yet gathering in that fellowship of the Lord Jesus. May you be with us. May you bless the work of your, of your church and your people, uh, even this evening. May we know the sense of your presence amongst us, your Holy Spirit uh, speaking through your word into our hearts, that you may have the glory and the honor and the Lord Jesus Christ may be lifted high. We pray all this then in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Well, we've come uh, this evening in our studies in the Acts of the Apostles uh, to chapter 6. And we're going to read that chapter. It's 15 verses, so not too long. Acts chapter 6 and verses 1 uh, to 15. We've seen in the previous chapters how the Lord has built his church and many thousands have come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But there have been problems, problems within the church and problems outside of the church. But there is a sense in which from chapter 6 and chapter 7, especially, and then moving into chapter 8, we discover that uh, things uh, turn uh, a great deal more troublesome. Well, perhaps that's the word we could use. Uh, there's, there's going to be a martyrdom and there's going to be a persecution to come. But we begin in chapter 6 and verse 1 with the reminder that the Lord has been blessing the church. So Acts chapter 6 verse 1. Now in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplying there rose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists. That was the uh, Hebrew uh, speakers and the Greek speakers because their wed widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, it is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out for from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. Then the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Then there rose some from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and those from Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. And when they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke, then they secretly induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him, seized him and brought him to the council. Then they also set up false witnesses who said, this man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against his holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. And all who sat in the council looking steadfastly at him, saw his face as the face of an angel. Well, may the Lord add his blessing uh, to his precious word 
uh, this, morning, uh, this evening. Well, we're going to uh, come in prayer in a moment. Uh, but just a bit of housekeeping. Uh, on Saturday, uh, we're going to be having a, a members meeting. So that's a, a reminder to the members meeting. Sun, Sunday, sorry. There we are, I got Saturday on a brain. Everybody's having a panic here. No, Sunday. Sunday after the morning service, a, a short members meeting. Uh, and so the members, you know all about that. Just a reminder uh, to you. Um, and then on Wednesday, uh, we're going to be going back to that book. Uh, we've been looking at a book uh, once a month, and the book is How to Talk About Jesus and Not Be That Guy. And we're going to look at tips uh, three and four in that book on Wednesday in a discussion uh, about that. And then uh, something that uh, Bob and Susan uh, Deacon uh, mentioned uh, to me is that... Uh, Sarah Deacon, that's their daughter, who's a missionary in uh, Slovenia, has got a new newsletter out. And if you like uh, a copy of that newsletter sent to you, if you let me know, I can uh, contact uh, the deacons. I don't mean the office bearers, I mean the deacons, uh, so that uh, you can get a copy of her latest newsletter and what she's doing there in Slovenia. Well, that's the housekeeping. Let's come uh, before the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for a, a day of rest, uh, a day in which, Lord, we can gather in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, whether we are listening and hearing online or whether we're in the building, we just praise you and thank you. That, that uh, this day gives, uh, gives and affords us an opportunity uh, to... Um, come before you and rest in you, uh, to hear uh, your word and to meditate upon your ways. And Lord, as it's the beginning of this first day of a new week, we pray, Father, that uh, as we enter into it now, you will give us help to serve you in your strength and in the wisdom that you give. Help us to have a full faith and to trust you in all things. Help us, Lord, also to know that working of the Holy Spirit within our souls so that people will not see us, but see Jesus shining out from us. Grant us discernment, Lord, in these days of, of difficulty and, and to a certain extent darkness. Help us to have that discernment to, see, to, to discern between good and evil, between right and wrong, between what is of you and what is not of you to discern for ourselves as individuals and for the life of the church that right path that you would desire us to walk upon. Because, Lord, we desire to give you the glory and the honour, not unto us, not to unto, unto us, O Lord, but to you may the glory be. We desire, O Lord, as well in our hearts to be more like our Lord Jesus, and so we do ask and pray that the Holy Spirit may so work in us and your word may indeed penetrate both mind and heart, shaping, forming us more into the image of your Son, our beloved Saviour. And Father, we do pray for the work of the gospel here in this place, uh, for the area in which you have given us to serve, Salford and Kensham, and other surrounding areas, and we ask and pray, Lord, uh, that you would uh, help us uh, to, to, go f to go out with the gospel, to share the good news, that you would open doors of ministry and a, a effective service so that through the work of your people, your word will be known, and Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ will be lifted high amongst us. To that end, Lord, we also pray for the work of the gospel in the United Kingdom. And thank you, Lord, for knowing of many go gospel churches, uh, Jesus-loving churches and Jesus-loving people. We pray, Father, that you would sustain and maintain those churches, that they may know your blessings upon their work and upon the desire they have also of going and telling and 
sharing the good news of Jesus. We pray, Father, that you might look down in mercy upon this part of the world, that we might know once more such a moving of your spirit, so that like the church at Jerusalem, we also might know those times of rich blessing where many, many folk come uh, to faith in Jesus in our own land. We thank you too, Lord, for the way that you are working in the world in which we live. We thank you that our nations, nations that are perhaps a century or so ago uh, did not know you, did not want to think about you. But now, Lord, you have vibrant churches and where, Lord, many, many thousands of people indeed are coming to faith day by day. We think of such places as Korea and uh, China and countries in South America also. And we rejoice in this and praise you for it. But we know, Lord, that there are also still very barren areas of the world where to be a Christian is to be persecuted and to suffer and perhaps even to face martyrdom. We pray that you would break through in these countries too, that the gospel would be seen as that one way to salvation and that one way to eternal life. But Lord, we praise you and thank you for the connections that we have uh, from this church too. We thank you for Sarah in Slovenia. We think of uh, Sean also uh, and pray, pray for them both as they seek to uh, go and tell and the gospel and to seek to work in those churches and to be engaged in uh, uh, work with the younger people also. We pray that you'd keep them safe. We pray, Father, that uh, you would direct their ways and that you would be their strength and their comfort, perhaps in difficult times. And so, Father, we pray and ask these things in, the, in and through the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, please turn with me uh, to Acts chapter 6. I'm hoping the screen will be on in a minute. Okay, we're waiting for a minute. There we, there we are. Um, right. That's it. We're going to be looking at Stephen again. We, we uh, began uh, thinking of um, free men last week, uh, the free uh, deacons that were called to, the, to work, to work with the apostles, the seven deacons. Uh, and... Uh, they were, of course, Stephen and Philip and Nicholas. But uh, this, this evening, we're going to be thinking of Stephen. And we described him like this. This is what the Bible describes him as being, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. I've got no control over this, so... Okay, we're gonna, I, think, uh, I think John will have to uh, sort that out. But anyway, we're, so we're going to think of Stephen. And uh, we described him as a man full of faith and of uh, the Holy Spirit. And one of the reasons for concentrating or beginning to concentrate on Stephen is this, is that uh, from uh, chapter 6 now and into chapter 7, it's all about Stephen. Or rather, it's all about Stephen's testimony or Stephen's witness. Uh, Stephen, the man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and the way he makes a stand, and eventually, of course, he will lose his life because of his faith in uh, the Lord Jesus. So, our first point is to just concentrate on that phrase about Stephen, being full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. But what I want to do, uh, using the first part of the chapter, is to understand the qualifications of being a leader of God's church. And we see that in the third verse. And so we've got verses 5 and 8. Well, we're going to be looking at verses 5 and 8 uh, quite a lot uh, this evening. But... Uh, let me just move on, if I can, to verse 3. 
Because in verse 3, uh, what the apostle said that they wanted the church members, the church people who had gathered together as a church of Jerusalem, was to, to look out for seven men of, and they say, of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. And the business, of course, was to, to look after the Greek-speaking uh, widows and the Hebrew-speaking widows. That was their, their role and their reputation. So that the apostles could then concentrate upon the ministry that was theirs of, of prayer and of the preaching and the teaching of God's word. Now, as you read this uh, passage of Acts chapter 6, it's obvious that Stephen was uh, this man of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, and we've already thought of him as being full of faith and, of course, of gain of the Holy Spirit. So there are these four uh, qualifications for being um, a leader, a, a servant of the church, a man of good reputation, full of faith, full of the Holy Spirit, full of wisdom. And we would put it and define it like this, godly wisdom. And that is really what is all, only what is required of a leader of the church of Jesus Christ. Some years ago now, quite a few years ago, I was invited to come and take a, a Sunday at a city centre church, uh, quite a big city centre church, and I met the deacons for the first time or the church leaders, the elders and the deacons. <laughs> and I was introduced to Professor so-and-so and Dr. so-and-so, and, -so, and uh, they were all uh, high-powered uh, people, uh, university lecturers, uh, GPs. Um, they were people of, of, of business. Uh, they were all professionals. And I was a bit, a bit sad, really, because it seemed to me that this church uh, was thinking in terms of the church officers as being, uh, in terms of being professional people, educated people, wealthy people. And it, somehow it didn't quite click with me that what the church needs are those qualifications that we find in Acts chapter 6. Not, that's not to say that these church officers were, didn't have those qualifications. It just seemed to be quite um, uh, as if the, that was the kind of people that were there in leadership in that church. But the quality of the leadership is supposed to be people of good reputation, full of faith, full of the Holy Spirit, and of godly wisdom. And those are the characteristics, I suggest, that ordinary believing people in Jesus should also have. Good reputation, being full of faith, full of the Holy Spirit, and wisdom, godly wisdom. So Sp Stephen was that, wasn't he? And we will see this more and more as we progress into chapter 7. But what I want to do uh, this evening is to go through those four characteristics, uh, those marks of, 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 of leadership, uh, and examine them. And uh, as I suggest, uh, hopefully, prayerfully, what we would seek to aspire to ourselves so let's go to the first of those, uh, a good reputation. So Stephen was a, a full of faith in the Holy Spirit, but he is a man of good reputation. It's something that uh, Paul mentions uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 3. When he's writing to Timothy and he's writing there about the, the qualifications for deacons and, and, and elders, uh, he makes the point that those who are appointed to a leadership position in the church should be people who, uh, from the outside world, are seen as those of a good reputation. That there shouldn't be anything in their lives whereby the world can point the finger and say, what is that person doing in leadership in your church? So I ask a question, a question of myself, a question to, to you. Is there something in your life that perhaps the world can point at and say, you call yourself a Christian? 
but you're doing this or you're doing that. Is there something in, in a man's life that uh, has marred his reputation in some way? Uh, but even if, it's, even, if, uh, even if it's something from his non-Christian past, because when you think about a leadership in the church, this is a public office, isn't it? And the one who is a public leader of the church is going to be looked at by the world. They will see the leadership of the church and they will uh, assess what the church is like from the leadership. So, <coughs> let me say this as well. This is not necessarily <laughs> God's perception of us because as God sees us, he sees us as sinners saved. He sees us as those who are saved through grace alone, through faith alone. But the world <coughs> will look at us. So let me give you an illustration of what I mean. Would you ask a man in the church who was spent some time in prison, perhaps as a robber, before he became a believer, <coughs> and uh, you would appoint him as the treasurer of the church? Well, I think that would be very difficult for that man. Perhaps there would be a temptation if that was his past life. Uh, if, if there was some problem with the funds of the church, who were they going to blame? And uh, what, would the church, what would the people of the world think of the church that had such a treasurer? Well, it, the image of the church is important. How it looks to the world is important. It's got to be seen as those folk who represent the Lord Jesus Christ. So we should be seeking to be holy and blameless in our conduct uh, before the world. We need to be looking at our own lives and to see if there's, some, if, there's, if there's anything in our own life that in some way could mar and blacken the name of the church or blacken the name of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. See, people might accuse us of many things. But we need, not to, we need to make sure that we are not found as those who could hurt the people of God, the church of God, and hurt Jesus himself. So one of the things that is important as a Christian is the pursuit of holiness and of godliness. Now that isn't just something for the zealous members of a church or the ultra-devoted people of the church. It should be a, a desire and a longing of all Christians, all believers, to be as holy and as godly as we can possibly be while we live here on earth. And that's something that uh, Peter challenges us uh, with. Uh, in 1 Peter... See, I'm messing things up today. Sorry, sorry, John. Uh, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 14 to 16, Peter writes this. Now, this is Peter writing to the church near the end of his life. And he's thinking in terms of, of a kind of general epistle to the churches. And he writes this. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts, so the former things that before you became a Christian, as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, in all the things that you do, says Paul, says Peter. You need to be striving towards holiness and godliness. And that perhaps is one of the problems with our own 21st century Christianity these days. We are too often conforming to the world rather than to what the scripture tells us. And God wants us to be a holy and a godly people for him. Because as Peter tells us there in verse 16, because he says, and he's quoting from uh, the Old Testament and in the books of Moses, because it is written, be holy for I am holy. So do we think of ourselves as the holy people of God? And are we seeking to to be the holy people of God in our own 
day and age. And as we, we look at Stephen uh, over the next few Sundays, we can say this of Stephen, that he is a man who indeed is holy in his conduct. His te- we see something of his testimony in Acts 6, uh, Acts 6 and Acts uh, 7. And in fact, uh, I think we can, we can point this out just in the last verse of the chapter. I haven't got it on the slide, I don't think. But uh, when they are putting uh, Stephen on trial, what, what does the scripture say? And all who sat in the council, looking steadfastly at him, saw his face as the face of an angel. There was something about Stephen that was holy, that was godly, that st- struck awe, if you like, into the, the leadership of, of the Sanhedrin Council, the Jews who were seeking uh, to uh, uh, destroy the church. So uh, there we have Stephen. And uh, Stephen uh, is a man of good reputation. Well, th- the next thing is this. We, we discover is that he is full of faith. Uh, so Stephen, the man of good reputation, he's a man full of faith. Uh, we see that in verse 8. And Stephen, we're told, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. So we're just concentrating for a moment on this phrase, full <coughs> of faith. Well, uh, this morning, we were looking at Ruth, and we were looking at uh, a man called uh, Elimelech. And one of the things you could say about Elimelech, he had a good name, but he wasn't full of faith. In fact, he was full of little faith, wasn't he? <coughs> Excuse me. So little was his faith that he moved from the promised land and from God's covenant people in order to go to Moab. But what does being full of faith mean? It means fully trusting God, fully trusting Jesus, no matter what. <coughs> oh, excuse me. I think I might need a glass of water, actually, Steve, if that's, if that's okay. <coughs> so what can we say about faith? Uh, how would you define faith? Well, we would define faith in this way, that it is a gift from God. And so, as we mentioned this morning, so I mentioned again, we go to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Thank you, Steve. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So faith is a a gift from God. It's not the kind of faith that some people have, that they have a faith that one day they may win the lottery. That's not the kind of faith that the Bible's talking about. It's It's a special faith, a special gift of faith that God gives to his people so that they have that faith to really believe in Jesus and to really trust in Jesus, and trusting God's promises. (coughs) Excuse me, I'm going to take some water. It means holding on to God in extreme circumstances. It means trusting God in all the things that happen to us. It means trusting God when the world doesn't trust God. It means perhaps... Going against the tide of the world's opinions and the world's thoughts. And it is a gift of God. But it's a gift that we need to apply in our lives daily. (coughs) It's not some kind of gift like a favoured aunt, you know, who's brought you a present. and uh, It's an ornament and you stick it on the shelf and you leave it there and it gathers dust. That's not the gift of faith that God gives us. God gives us this gift so that we use it, that we we grow it. Faith is meant 
to be prayed about. Faith is meant to grow in us. Uh, it's something that we should say to God in prayer. Lord, give me more faith. Faith is often tested. But God uses the testing of faith to make us grow more like Jesus. To make us more full of faith. And it's a case of faith not in some things, but in all things when it comes to God. So faith is to be used and tested. It's not to be a mantelpiece faith that looks good, but doesn't do anything. And this is Stephen. He's a man full of faith. Another thing about Stephen, we're told, is this. He was full of the Holy Spirit. That was one of the qualifications that these deacons, these people who were going to work alongside the apostles, had to have. They had to be full of the Holy Spirit. And for that, we go to Acts chapter 6 and verse 3. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit. Now, let me remind you of something. The Holy Spirit is a person. Okay? That's important. The Holy Spirit is, in fact, the third person of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is God, the Holy Spirit. And that means to be full of the Holy Spirit means to be full of God. And when a person becomes a Christian then the Holy Spirit becomes part of us and lives in us and dwells in us. When you are a Christian, God the Holy Spirit is with you and in you. And as we were talking about the faith, well, the Holy Spirit is also given to every person who believes in Jesus. And in a very real and yet in a spiritual sense, we become one with God. And Jesus spoke of this unity in John chapter 17 and verses 20 to 21. In the previous chapter, he spoke uh, about how God the Holy Spirit would come to the disciples, would come uh, to the people who would believe in him, that he would dwell in them. But in John 17 and verses 20 to 21, we read these words. Jesus is praying, he's praying on the night in which he was betrayed, and he's praying to the Father, and he says, I do not pray for these alone, that's the disciples that were there listening to his prayer, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. That for the Christian, there's a union with Christ. That's the, that's the theological term. There's a union with God through the Holy Spirit. And just like faith, and we talked about uh, praying for faith, that, that, uh, uh, that we might have more faith. Well, just like faith, we need to pray uh, for more of an awareness of God the Holy Spirit at work in us. We don't need to pray for God the Holy Spirit to come, more of God the Holy Spirit to be in us because God the Holy Spirit is in us. But we need to pray for more of an awareness of the working of God the Holy Spirit in us, in every aspect of our lives, both in the church life and in our secular life. And Paul gave a warning to a church, to the Corinthian church, about that, reminding them of the fact that the Holy Spirit is in the church and the Holy Spirit is in believers in Jesus. And that is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verses 19 and 20. Paul, in that particular chapter, is concerned that some of those Christians might fall back into their non-Christian ways and end up doing things which were sinful and ungodly. And he says to these Christians in Corinth, he 
He says, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? In other words, don't you, don't you, rem, don't you remember? Don't you know that God the Holy Spirit is in you? Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God. See, it was a gift also. And you are not your own. For you were bought at a price. Well, what was the price? It was the price of Jesus' death upon the cross, wasn't it? His shed blood, paying the price for our sins. For you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You are not your own. God, the Holy Spirit, lives in you. You are the body of the... Uh, your, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's something that perhaps we need to remind ourselves about. God, the Holy Spirit, lives in us. We're to be full of the Holy Spirit. Pray for a greater awareness of God, the Holy Spirit, working in us and through us. We should remind ourselves that we should be seeking to have that uh, Unity, if you like, with the Spirit. And that the Holy Spirit should be, be, well, I put it like this, should be shining out from us. That the Holy Spirit might be seen in us. That people of the world might realize that there is something different about these people. And something different about this church. Why? Because of the Holy Spirit who is in us and working in us. And we see this, I think, uh, demonstrated in Acts chapter 6 and verse 10. Because there we have a picture. We have a picture of Stephen. Stephen is in a situation where people are, uh, uh, well, they're, they're disputing. They're angry with him. Uh, and uh, this is a particular synagogue, and we'll mention this synagogue next time. But they're in dispute with Stephen. And we're told there in verse 10 that these people who were uh, arguing and disputing and getting angry with Stephen, we're told, and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit, capital S, by which he spoke. I wonder if you've ever met a Christian. Well, that's a stupid question. But have you ever met a Christian, possibly for the first time, and when you've talked with them or you've met them, you say there is something special about them. There, there's something about them. Perhaps they haven't even said very much. But there's something about them, and you know within your own soul, this is a, a holy man. This is a godly woman. There's something about them that you can recognize that they are full of the Holy Spirit. They are special. Let me tell you a story about a remarkable incident that happened in the life of a man called John Elias. Uh, John Elias lived about 1800, so it's quite a few years ago now. Uh, John Elias was a, a preacher. Uh, he was very much an evangelist that God used at the time of revival, and John Elias was used to the, the salvation of many souls and the building of many churches in North Wales. But there's an special occasion uh, uh, that you, you can read of in his uh, biography. It, there was a horse fair. It was held in a place called Rithlin, uh, right in the middle, it's near, near Clandid, no and Colwyn Bay. It's up in the, up in the valleys a bit. But there was this horse fair in this place called Rithlin. And it was always on a Sunday. And the whole day was taken over to this horse fair. And it was a, a time of uh, drinking and swearing and all kinds of tomfoolery were, was taking place. And there were fights and brawls and uh, horse races and boxing and all kinds of things were being uh, held at this place in Rithlin. And it was so, uh, so 
uh, secular, if you like, and so much of a big thing that all the churches in Rithland shut their doors. They didn't have their services because even some of the church members would go to this fair. It just took over the place. Well, John Elias got so disturbed about this in his soul that he felt that he needed to do something. And the only thing he could think of for, that he could do was to go and preach the gospel. And so he announced a few days before that he would go and stand on the steps of a pub called the Red Lion. And he couldn't go into a church because all the churches were closed because it was the horse fair. So he said he was going to stand on the steps of the Red Lion and he would preach the gospel. But when he arrived there, there was a great crowd of people. They weren't there to listen to John Elias. They were there to hurt John Elias. They came with their clubs and their sticks and their bottles and their stones. But John Elias believed that God would have him preach the gospel. So he went onto the steps of the red line. The people gathered around him. He read the scriptures. He read a psalm. And then he prayed. And then he preached. And one person who was converted on that occasion said this, that when he read the psalms, the club that he had in his hand seemed so heavy in his hand that he couldn't hold it any longer and he had to drop it to the floor. And when he started praying, he felt as if his arms were so heavy that he couldn't move his arms and he couldn't move from the spot. He had come with the intention of hurting the preacher, but he couldn't move. He, was, he felt as if he was paralyzed. And then... John Elias preached. His heart was opened to the gospel. And he came to faith in the Lord Jesus. That was one man's testimony. But many, many hundreds of people got converted that day through that ministry. So what happened? What was the cause? Well, we could say humanly, perhaps. It was because... A man called John Elias stood up on the steps of the Red Lion pub and he, he read the scriptures and he prayed and he preached. But there was something different on that day because John Elias was full of the Holy Spirit and of power. God was at work. God dealt with these people. And as far as I know, there's never been a horse fair in Ridlin ever since. In fact, it was so famous, they produced a commemorative mug uh, because of the occasion. It was a remarkable experience of God, the Holy Spirit, taking and using a man and so filling him with the, with the Holy Spirit and with power. Do we want to be a people ourselves who are full of the Holy Spirit? Then pray. Pray that the Holy Spirit would be more at work in you. So much at work in you that people of the world would even would notice and see and speak of it. Do you want your pastor to be a man of, uh, full of the Holy Spirit and power when the word is being preached? Then pray. Pray for that anointing of, of, of preachers. Pray for a power in the pulpit that can stir the souls of men and women and boys and girls. You see, there are many good preachers and there are many good sermons. And you can go on the internet and you can, you can hear these good preachers and you can hear these good sermons. But in a sense... That is not what we need. We need men and women full of the Holy Spirit and of power. That's what we need in the church today. About 30 years ago, I met a pastor. He was an elderly pastor. Uh, I think he was pastoring a church until he was about 90. <laughs> 
But um, one of the remarkable things about, about him when I met him was that he had been a young boy in the days of revival in 1904. And he, he, he was telling us about how as a, as a teenager he knew these revival preachers, people that God had used uh, in, in Wales, uh, North Wales and South Wales. And he had lived so long that he had, I think he, we, we got to about the late 80s and early 90s, he was still alive and, and died when he was about 90 or so. Uh, and he made this comment about the preachers and the churches of the day when he was in his 90s. And he said this word, and these are words that have challenged me ever since. He said this concerning what had happened in the days of revival in 1904 in Wales and what was happening in Wales when he was in his 90s. He said this, there is not much power these days. And that's true, isn't it? I don't think things have changed. Now we're in 2021. There's not much power in the pulpit these days. Well, we need to pray for that power in the pulpit. We need to pray for the preachers of the gospel. We're going to pray for ourselves that we also might be full of the Holy Spirit and of power. Well, one final thing. And uh, this is our next point that Stephen because this is one of the qualifications of being a deacon, of being a church leader, was wisdom. Acts chapter 6 and verse 3 once more. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit, and wisdom. There are two types of wisdom, I think. One is worldly wisdom, and the other is godly wisdom wisdom. Worldly wisdom might make you rich. It might make you powerful. It might give you a comfortable life. It may give you all the desires that you can possibly have uh, for life. But worldly wisdom will never give you heaven. Godly wisdom is something different. Because godly wisdom has in mind not the things of this world, but the things of heaven. Godly wisdom is that which hones us and shapes us and fashions us and prepares us for an eternity in heaven. I wonder uh, this evening, do you, do you think you lack wisdom? Do you think you lack a godly wisdom? especially in the world in which we live at the moment, you might say to me, you might say to yourself, how can I live my life as a Christian, as a believer in Jesus, in, in, the, in the ungodly world in which I live? How can I live as a Christian in such a dark world? Well, the answer is, godly wisdom is our help to live as believers for Jesus in the world in which we find ourselves. And let me take you to one verse of scripture as we come to a close. It comes from James and chapter 1 and verse 5. And you know this verse, I'm sure. If any of you lacks wisdom. I think, I think James is not talking about worldly wisdom, really. Uh, there is a sense in which he's talking about making decisions. But we want to make godly decisions. We may want to make the right decisions that will honor and glorify Jesus and God. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God. Bring it before God in prayer, he says. Who gives to all liberally. Who gives to all freely. And without reproach. And it will be given to him. That's the real wisdom, isn't it? That's the real godly wisdom. To bring all our decision making, all our difficulties, all our um, uh, things that we have to deal with in our lives and to bring it all before God in prayer. So you've got, got Stephen, a man full of the Holy Spirit, full of faith, a man of good reputation, a man of 
godly wisdom. What's the connecting connections between all those four things? Well, it's prayer, isn't it? It's prayer. Pray to be that person full of faith, that person full of the Holy Spirit, that person of good reputation, that person who has godly wisdom. That's what it means to be a Christian. And that's what it means to be a, a leader in God's church in the days in which we live. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we ask and pray uh, very much for help. Uh, we have been thinking uh, this day, Lord, morning and evening, really, about the dark world in which we live, uh, where there seems to be so much ungodliness, uh, that, Lord, people's uh, um, lifestyles and people's uh, morality all seem to be drifting so far away from, uh, from the, the Bible standards, from your standards. And, Lord, it seems to us at times that to be a Christian, to be a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ is getting more and more difficult. And so what we are pleading for, Lord, is more of your, your Holy Spirit at work in us, that you would increase our faith in these days, that you would uh, enable us, Lord, by, by your strengthening, uh, by your dealings with us, that we might be a people of good reputation, and that, Lord, you would grant to us wisdom, not the wisdom of the world, but the wisdom of heaven itself. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.